September 15, 2016, Varnish version 5 was released. This video is all about the new features, the changes and the improvements. The fact that it's called 5.0 and not 4.2 would imply that lots of changes have happened and new features were added. Not really the case. There's two reasons why it's called 5.0. Because they switched from a feature-based release schedule to a time-based release schedule. So every six months you can expect a new release. This one was September 15th. The next one is March 15th. Reason number two why this is called 5.0 is because a major feature was added and that's support for HTTP2 or H2 as we tend to call it. On popular demand it, uh, it was implemented or at least some of it was implemented. Because of the strict deadlines and strict release schedules they ship what they had and this is what we have right now an experimental release where you could send HTTP2 traffic through and uh, it will work but it was advised by the Varnish community it stated in the release notes that it's not really for uh, large-scale production environments. So use with care but still test it. I've tested it, it works fine. Word of warning, HTTP2 is not enabled by default. If you want to enable it, it's a feature flag that has to be mentioned at startup time, so when you start your Varnish instance. So that means if you don't enable the HTTP2 feature flag, Varnish 5 just behaves like any other Varnish. So what about TLS? Because the browser communities have decided that all HTTP2 traffic should be sent over an encrypted connection using TLS. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have the Varnish community that holds its ground and doesn't want to implement TLS into Varnish D. Because A, they don't believe it's their core business, and B, they don't believe that libraries such as OpenSSL and others are stable and secure enough to be implemented in their code. Varnish tackles this issue by actively promoting TLS terminators that terminate the TLS connection for you and speak plain old HTTP between that terminator and Varnish. Varnish also supports the proxy protocol that is convenient when using multiple layers of proxying. That means the real IP address of the client could be sent end-to-end -end without interruption. Given the context of HTTP2, it is important that your TLS terminator also supports HTTP2. Within the Varnish community, there's an open source project called Hitch. And Hitch is a minimalistic TLS terminator that supports both the proxy protocol and the HTTP2 protocol. Very convenient to use, and it speaks HTTP with Varnish and still managed to send through HTTP2 traffic. In Varnish 5, a new director has been introduced, the shard director. Directors are responsible for load balancing and they group backends and decide which request goes to which backend. It uses decision-making strategies such as round robin or random, while with the shard director, you can use a consistent hashing algorithm to consistently link a request to a specific backend. If that backend would drop and come back up, the request would go back to that server again. The shard director is especially useful when you require a certain consistency between requests and the backend where it arrives. It could be IP-based, where you always want that IP to hit a very specific backend, or when you want URLs to hit that backend. Varnish 5 also features a behavior change in the hit for pass logic. Hit for pass is a blacklist, a sort of negative cache, where items get marked that aren't considered cacheable by Varnish. So whenever such an item gets negatively cached, it gets stored there for by default 120 seconds. So that means for the next 120 seconds, that very same request will never be retrieved from cache. That led to confusion with a lot of people, including myself in the beginning when I was learning Varnish, because you have the impression that this request could be served from cache and yet a backend connection is made. Well, they changed that behavior in Varnish 5 and now it will be hit for miss, no longer hit for pass. So that means if an item isn't considered cacheable, it will be immediately sent to the backend without having to be put on the wait list, but every other request that does meet the criteria will be served from cache. In the past, it used to be the uncacheable scenario wins. So for 120 seconds, that item will not be cached and will be marked uncacheable. Whereas now, as soon as it sees a subsequent request that does match the criteria to be cacheable, it will be served from cache. Another useful addition in Varnish 5 is proxy protocol support at the backend level. In 4.1, the proxy protocol was already introduced for the client level, the front-end level. That means that regardless of the number of hops that you put in front of Varnish, let's say you have a TLS terminator or a load balancer in front of Varnish, by using the proxy protocol, a TCP preamble is used that transmits the real IP address of the client. So you don't rely on X484 magic using the proxy protocol that is sent end-to-end, -end, so Varnish would receive that information. As of Varnish 5.0, you can transmit that information to your web server, and your web server could immediately receive the real IP. You can enable proxy protocol communication with your backend by stating, by adding, a proxy header. 
as soon as you mention that header, it will use the proxy protocol. Please make sure your backend supports that, otherwise you won't get requests through and you'll probably get a 503 backend not available. The proxy header could take either value one or value two, value one meaning proxy protocol version one and two meaning proxy protocol version two. So that all depends on the version of the proxy protocol that your web server supports. The final feature we'll discuss is support for multiple VCL files and VCL jump labels. Previous versions of Varnish already supported multiple VCL files. You can register multiple VCL files and give it the name label and switch on the fly. While as of Varnish 5, you can use that label within your VCL to do on the fly switching from within your main VCL file. A new return state has been introduced, it's called VCL, and it takes the label as an argument. That label represents the label with which you registered that VCL file. As soon as the finite state machine of Varnish notices this, it stops the execution of the current VCL file, loads that other VCL file, and continues execution. The upside of VCL jump labels is that everything is nicely organized in its own VCL file. You don't have to use includes, you don't have to use custom subroutines, and whenever something changes in one of the subordinate VCL files, you don't have to reload the main VCL file. That's it. A couple of additions to Varnish 5 and a couple of behavior changes. There's plenty more. Go to varnishcache.org to see the full list and check out the full documentation. In the meanwhile, go ahead and test it, and if you're running it in production using HTTP2, please let me know what you think of it. That's all for now. See you next time.